Good evening. The book uh, I will be discussing now is Subaltern Studies 2.0 by Melinda Banerjee and Yell Wouters. It's published by Prickly Paradigm Press in Chicago in 2022. Uh, this is a press that usually publishes pamphlets, but pamphlets, as we know, are also generally tracts. And in that respect, even though this book is far from being a pamphlet, you can tell from the thickness of the work that it's far more than a pamphlet. It's, in fact, 200 20 some odd pages, that this work is very much a political tract. It's a political intellectual tract. And I must say, I am very surprised that it has received what appears to me to be little attention. The book is deserving of far greater attention than it has received thus far. And I hope to be able to explain why that is the case. Now, subaltern studies 2.0 obviously suggests that there's something called subaltern studies 1.0. And in fact, many people will be aware that there was a project, a project known as subaltern studies, writings in South Asian history and society, 12 volumes of which appeared beginning in 19, if I recall correctly, 1983, and published somewhere until about 2010, perhaps a year or two after that. And then the collective disbanded, whether the collective disbanded because it had run out of steam or because the various people associated with it thought that they had fulfilled the purpose for which the collective had been established, I can't really say. Now, the first six volumes of subordinate studies were edited by Ranajit Guha, who passed away just this year. Earlier this year, I think it was sometime in the summer or perhaps in the, perhaps in the early autumn. And he passed away just a month short of being 100 years old, he had been living in Vienna for decades. And Ranajit Gua is a name that is known to every scholar of modern India, particularly scholars of Indian history, but also, I dare say, people who study such things as caste and people who are scholars who are anthropologists, sociologists, people involved in cultural studies, and so on. Uh, volume one, as I said, appeared sometime around 82 or 83, and it came not merely as a whiff of fresh air, it came as a jolt. It came as a jolt because of the intellectual promise, promised by subaltern studies, but also because it dared to dethrone nationalist discourse as well. It suggested that there was a complicity between colonial imperialist discourse and nationalist discourse, that the two shared certain assumptions, but fundamentally, both of them were elitist, as he says. And so there's a contrast that's established between the elites and the subalterns. And the word subaltern is a word taken from Gramsci. It appears in what are known as the prison notebooks. And of course, the word subaltern designates actually a military rank, the lowest military rank, uh, this, the prefix sub, as in submarine, sub, subdued, etc., subterranean, below the earth, suggests some, someone, the word subaltern suggests someone who sits at the bottom of the social ladder. And what Rajit Gua proposed to do, along with the group of young intellectuals who had formed around him, what he proposed to do was to try to establish that the subaltern didn't merely have a voice, that the subaltern consciousness, 
and the agency that they had constituted an autonomous domain of politics and that they were carving out a sphere of thought and action which was distinctly their own. Now, I have given a talk on Ranajit Gua's book, Elementary Aspects of Peasant Insurgency, which can be found on my YouTube channel where this talk is also located. And so I really won't get into the work of Ranajit Gua. I want to move straight away to Subaltern Studies 2.0. But I think it is important to understand one thing, which is that Subaltern Studies grew out of what we might call the disappointments attendant upon independence. The dream of independence had soured. Early 1980s, this is 35 years after independence, unemployment was still very high. India had just shortly come out of the emergency that had been imposed by Mrs. Gandhi between June 1975 and early 1977. A substantial portion of the country still lived lives of deep poverty. And India did not have a presence on the intellectual scene. In fact, Ronald Linden, a very well-known professor at the University of Chicago and the author of a book called Imagining India, went so far as to say when subaltern studies came out, right? That, and I quote, Indians are perhaps for the first time since colonization showing sustained signs of reappropriating the capacity to represent themselves. Now, this is not really characteristic of Indians writing, I would say, because the sheer audacity, but more importantly and more disturbingly, the apparent condescension, given that his own work, Imagining India, had been a blistering critique along the lines of Saeed's Orientalism on colonial discourse in India, right? But, and, and of course, it is the, the time span that he's invoking that he, he's, he says, our Indians are perhaps for the first time since colonization. So perhaps for the first time in 250 odd years that Indians are showing the capacity to represent themselves. And he was referring to the Subaltern Studies Project and it will suffice to say that the Subaltern Studies Project unquestionab unquestionably launched India, or I should say Indian social sciences and history, on the world map. Now, that's not to say that Indian intellectual work of, in the modern period had never made a dent before. We know that there have been eminent scientists. We know that Indian statistics, for example, in particular, had been singularly important. That the work in Indian statistics, Indian statisticians, uh, their work was greatly admired. But certainly, I think in the social sciences and in history, what Indian was trying to suggest, and what I think most people would agree with, people who are in the know in any case, that in subordinate studies, we had for the first time an intellectual effort to create a new school of thought emanating from India, from the global south, that would now go on to exercise considerable influence in the academy in the West. Subaltern Studies 2.0 is an effort not to revive subaltern studies, it's an effort to see what next after subaltern studies, right? And I must say that this work is very daring. I love the enthusiasm, the exuberance of the authors. I know that my appreciation of it will not necessarily be shared by everyone else. And some commentators will doubtless think of their work as naive. Nevertheless, given that we are now living in the Anthropocene age. This work suggests that subaltern studies or whatever school of thought emanates from the global south in the domain of history, in the allied social sciences, in, in humanistic reasoning, will have to think about the kind of future we wish to inherit, right? And so 
this book must be read <coughs> in that spirit. Now, um, what is it that the authors of this work are attempting to do? So they point to what they consider to be some of the shortcomings in Marx. Uh, of course, like uh, all commentators working in this kind of domain, they're, uh, they rely upon Marx to some degree. They're well read in Marx, or at least that seems to be the case. But they also think that there are certain kinds of shortcomings uh, in Marx, that there are shortcomings indeed actually in the social sciences as a whole. Whether it's the social sciences in India, which of course are but a copy for the most part of the social sciences as they're practiced in the West, right? They suggest that that body of knowledge that is encompassed in the modern social sciences will not be very constructive in helping us think about the Anthropocene age, right? I'm going to briefly discuss their idea of how to think about the nature of intellectual work in our age and what kind of intellectual work is required in order for there to be a democratic future. And this is where the book is different from subaltern studies. And indeed, I would say from the vast bulk of humanistic inquiry. How a democratic future has to be shaped that will be attentive not only to humans, but to non-humans, to all the species. So they are thinking about a multi-species being. This is the philosophical term, of course, uh, that is used, uh, the idea of being, right? The, the idea of what we might call geist, a certain spirit. The uh, being in this being, as they use it, is a term that is, as I said, exceedingly well known in certain kinds of philosophical inquiry. And what they're talking about is creating a multi-species being. And they suggest that there are actually precedents also for a multi-species kind of demos or democracy. And this is where, of course, the book is going to take a huge hit if it hasn't already, although as I pointed out, I haven't heard much attention being riveted on the book. I haven't checked to see if there are any reviews of the book. But nevertheless, one of the things that they talk about, for example, is animal democracy. Now, let me take it, let me take things a little slowly and suggest some of the other features and then also point to some of the limitations. One of the ways in which we can approach it is that we can differentiate this book from a very recent book published in 2021 on which I will do a talk later on, a separate talk, a book called The Climate of History by Dipesh Chakrabarti, who of course was a member of the Subaltern Studies Collective. Right? Now, in The Climate of History, what Dipesh Chakrabarti suggests is that in fact, much of humanistic inquiry in a certain manner of speaking is becoming obsolete. It's becoming obsolete because we are now for the first time in history living in an age where human beings are not just biological agents, they are geological agents, geological agents. That is the hand of human beings has wrought such enormous changes, usually encapsulated in the term global warming, right? Which sharply accelerated after the onset of the Industrial Revolution and the last 75 years in particular have been absolutely devastating, right? With consequences that we are all aware of. Uh, we know that there are still some people who are climate change deniers, but we can ignore them really for the purposes of our argument or even otherwise, uh, if they don't really wish to think about what is really happening today, uh, right? So in the climate of history, what Dipesh Chakrabarti suggests is that it will not be sufficient to think of the lines of inquiry created by scholars such as Marx, 
to whose work, of course, he's very heavily indebted in many ways, uh, or created by thinkers such as Hegel or Heidegger, uh, or any of the other usual theorists from the, let's say, from the 20th century who were summoned by most people who work uh, on uh, questions of agency, politics, uh, and so on, right? What the Pei Shakyamuni argues is that the Anthropocene prevails, trumps over the Capitalocene. The subtitle of this book is not on the cover, but it is on the inside title page, Being Against the Capitalocene, right? Being Against the Capitalocene. And what the Pei Shakyamuni is trying to suggest is that if we're thinking of the present age, we must understand, as I pointed out, that the scales of historical time are not going to be particularly useful. These are the scales, of course, that are the bread and butter of the historian's work. Right? They're not going to be particularly understand to, uh, useful to understand how the world has been completely transformed because of human beings now become, becoming geological agents. Right? And so we need a new kind of vocabulary. We need a new kind of imagination. And in some ways, of course, everything that we do will become obsolete if we are not attentive to the problem of global warming. The summation of Banerjee and Wouters is somewhat different. They're not obviously indifferent to the Anthropocene, but they do not agree. They will, with, with Chakrabarti, they will have none of uh, none of this hierarchy that Chakrabarti establishes of the Anthropocene over the Capitalocene. From their point of view, global warming and the scorching heat of capitalism feed into each other, militate against the being, and oppress equally humans and non-humans. And in the course of this book, what they do then is they summon many instances almost all from pre-modern societies, right? Many instances of where there was a certain kind of synergy, a certain kind of commodiousness, capaciousness in the manner in which humans interacted with non-humans. They even suggest, by the way, that there be non-human democracies, so to speak. This will make them, of course, I think the, the butt of many jokes. Uh, uh, I think that their arguments should be taken perhaps with a pinch of salt, but also with some real seriousness, right? And so they, and, and, and by that, I mean, I mean, think about the Jataka tales. Go back to 500 CE, right? Now, why is it that in the Jataka tales that, or think about the Panchatantra, think about the Hitopatesh, Right? Why is it that the characters are all animals? And why is it that these animals, in fact, are engaged in certain kinds of what we can call dialogues, which may well be dialogues between human beings? And of course, it has often been argued that one of the things that, that was attempted at that time, let's say in 500 BCE, was the idea that dense philosophical ideas would not be, how should we put it, translatable, okay, would not, be, would not be palpably evident, would not be understood by common people. And so, the, so therefore you find the use of allegories and parables. Right? And of course that's an argument that we have to take with some seriousness, but nevertheless, the point is that what they're trying to suggest is that there are these examples from history of what we might call a certain kind of interaction between humans and non-humans. And they're also suggesting that within a species, there are certain forms of what we might call democracy that we can think about, right? And so they talk about even, they even talk about fungal democracy. They talk about yaks. And one of the most interesting things about this book, I mean, it's really quite a, Quite a blast, frankly. Uh, 
all right? It's really a blast, I mean, but you have to have a sense of humor as well. Um, uh, and it's a blast be uh, partly because uh, they draw examples from Bhutan. In fact, one of these scholars, I think it's Yel Wouters, he's actually, uh, I believe, a Dutch scholar who's based in Bhutan. Uh, when's the last time you heard of any scholar from Bhutan, a Dutch scholar from Bhutan, um, uh, or living in Bhutan? Uh, so they draw examples from Bhutan. Uh, they draw extensively on the scholarship on the Nagas, on Mizoram, right? And I think that this is also very refreshing. Uh, yes, they are the usual invocations. I mean, Melinda Banerjee is a is a Bengali, and so they're the usual invocations to Rabindranath Tagore here and there. Uh, but really, what is refreshing is that they are very ecumenical in that sense. They draw upon uh, Indian uh, philosophical traditions very widely, and in that respect, this book is very different because what subaltern studies did indeed what every scholar does. And I think this is a significant departure. What is it that every scholar does? That India is just the field, the area where the scholar goes, right, with Western theory, with theory coming from the, from the Western Academy. And then you use that theory to try to understand these societies. In fact, we can say that what they are attempting to do is they are att attempting to use the examples from these societies, theoretical examples, examples of praxis, of theory in action, right? And think about the world from the margins. If we can call the northeast of India and Bhutan and various other societies, think about all of this as the margins and think about the center because they're saying there's something profoundly problematic, right? I don't think I should use that word problematic. I don't like that word. There's something profoundly disturbing about the, the center, i.e. Europe, because it is, after all, Europe that shaped the modern world, Europe that bequeathed to us the categories that the various disciplines, academic disciplines, have generated, right? Now, so, uh, 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 and, and this book is a work of, uh, you know, collective authorship. In fact, they disown the idea of authorship because they say that this is another, um, uh, another uh, uh, idea that they really want to uh, uh, disown. The author uh, is a recent invention in the history of humanity. Uh, we certainly know that uh, that is very much uh, uh, an argument that we can adhere to if we, if we look at the Indian past and if we look at works like the Upanishads, uh, you know, the Bhagavad Gita and so on. Um, th th there is no singular author there. The Mahabharata is far from having a singular author, no matter what some Indians might believe, uh, given that it was composed over a period of something like 800 years, from 400 uh, BCE, to BCE to about 400 CE. And one of the book's many virtues is this mellifluous blend of poetry, prose, polemics. Right? Um, you don't find that really in works of scholarship. They take inspiration from philosophers and singing minstrels from many lands. And so in that sense, they transgress nation state boundaries, boundaries of disciplines. And the authors proclaim themselves less as author owners of words and more as bards singing about a war, right? Bards singing about a war. Um, now, what might be some of the limitations of this work? I have written a very extensive essay, which will be published in a few months, uh, perhaps a bit sooner, uh, on this book. Um, and so I don't want to get into some of these matters in very great detail, uh, although I do want to hint, hint at some of, the, some of the reservations I might have. Uh, I was saying that this is a work of collective authorship, and the collective extends to more than just the two principal authors who are listed, because you can see here that they are listed at the top, and then you find the names of people like Gayatri Spivak, Gayatri Spivak, uh, and Suraj Yengde, Thom von Duran, and others. Um, each of them, so Gayatri Spivak gives the most extended response. Um, and she has uh, some critical observations, which I don't really have the time to share over here. 
Uh, she also thinks that the book might be a little bit too much South Asia centric, uh, but but I think the authors can be forgiven for that. And again, the South Asia that they invoke is not the South Asia that most scholars really are uh, familiar with, right? Uh, what is the book trying to do? Uh, I've already suggested that, but we can say that the aphorism, Marx's really well-known aphorism from the 18th Brumaire is, uh, is something that they take to heart. The philosophers Marx wrote have hitherto only interpreted the world in various ways. The point, however, is to change it, end quote, right? And they indict the two disciplines of history and anthropology from which they respectively come. Um, Melinda Banerjee coming largely from history, Wouters, I think, coming largely from anthropology, right? Uh, they... Uh, and what they enter into is, is a kind of a systematic critique. Uh, so, you know, if you look at biblical studies, you look at the origins of Western civilization and all of that, people, you know, there's a, whole dis, there's a whole story, of course, about the fall, about what happened in the Garden of Eden with Adam and Eve. Um, well, they describe actually four falls. Um, uh, the first fall is the banishment of non-humans from being. And then the second fall is when humans began to divide among each other. The third fall was the silencing of women. And the fourth fall was a subjugation of all community speech. Now that's significant because it suggests to us that one of the things they're attempting to do is to invoke certain notion of the community, right? And the wisdom of communities, particularly communities that had forged a certain kind of democratic ethos, not just amongst themselves, but with other species. And they suggest that some of the readings that have been offered of um, uh, many of these societies are very mistaken. So for example, take an example of head hunting, right? So head hunting was very common among the Nagas, but they point out that, in fact, this head, head hunting was always very much local, right? This head hunting was literally a cephalus, that is, without a head. There was no state. It was really confined, and it was confined to local communities, and it was done for a certain purpose, and when that objective was met, that was sufficient, right? And they point out, and I think I would agree with them, that in fact, the tribals, which include the Nagas, who were sacrificed under colonial rule to principles of extraction, to exploitation, that that was a form of head hunting which was far more vicious than what the Nagas themselves actually really practiced. All right? So I said that I have quite a few reservations. Um, uh, and I, as, as I mentioned, I've written a long article on this, which, um, uh, which means that I don't really want to get into these reservations in any great detail. But let me just give you an instance of one or two of these and then wrap up my discussion, right? So I think that one of the problems is that the authors are unable to move beyond rights talk. Rights talk is very much a modern way of thinking about human beings. And of course, we know that we are, and the, and the privileges and entitlements that they should have. And we know that, of course, the universe of rights is an ever-expanding universe. I mean, 200, 250 years ago, if you look at the Declaration of the Rights of Man and Citizen, right, which came out of the French Revolution, uh, 1789, uh, you know, they talk about the freedom of speech, freedom of expression, freedom of assembly, as did, of course, uh, the American Revolution, uh, as did the Constitution of the United States. Right? But now, of course, people speak about rights to dozens of things. Right, The right of human beings to clean air, clean soil, clean water, to housing, to a job, to banking. Because if you're not able to bank, you can't really function properly. Right? If you're not able to use a bank, you're not able to function in a modern society. 
And there are multiple rights of this kind. Now, they have a they have a vigorous critique of the nation state, but they seem to be unable to think through this properly because you can't really be advocating for rights, as it were. You need a different language and want to demolish the nation state. And this is apart from the question that the state which they rightly critique and which is in fact the most egregious violator of rights in almost every society, this very state is a state to which human rights activists will go when they want rights conferred on people, to which communities will go. Because who else confers rights? It's usually the state, right? And of course, we know that in, in countries like New Zealand and India, just to take two examples, uh, these are countries where what I'm going to refer to now, I, I know exactly what transpired, where courts in these two countries in the last six, seven years have ruled that rivers have rights, mountains have rights, right? A mountain has a right not, not to be mined. The river has a right not to be polluted. Trees have rights. The Uttarakhand court, high court, ruled that rivers have rights. But the court said that, in fact, the river is also a minor. Someone else has to speak on its behalf, right? Uh, so there are, so, and, and I'm suggesting that there's a fundamental problem with this question uh, of rights. Uh, there are also philosophical issues that we can really take up. Uh, for example, these activists who have called for conferring legal rights to rivers, mountains, or trees, they clearly conflate the juridical notion of personhood and the rights that are attendant upon persons with the sovereign nature of deities as understood in Hinduism, a subject on which Indian courts have deliberated in many cases. Um, I should also say that the authors do not always understand the implications of their own findings. So this is the second um, argument that I will take up. And as I said, I will not take up the other critiques that I have because I would like to keep this, uh, this uh, uh, talk, uh, uh, you know, uh, confine it to about 35, 37 minutes at most. Um, uh, when I say that they don't always follow the implications of their own findings or don't always understand them, their discussion of the Nagas is a case in point. Now, I've already suggested to you what is it that um, uh, they are saying about the Nagas, and I've suggested thus far that I actually agree with their description of headhunting. Right? I might add, and as a side, that under the British dispensation, the practice of sati, the immolation of widows, that was to the plains, to the plains of India, what headhunting was to the hills, varieties of colonial discourse on cannibalism, if I may put it this way. Now, in any case, what they say about the Nagas, so far, so good, right? <clears throat> um, but let's understand what follows. They argue that we cannot speak of, when we're thinking of a Naga state, right? One cannot, we cannot speak of a Naga state, there isn't one really, and Thus, one cannot speak of linguistic unity or comparatively centralized forms of communication. And here I'm going to quote from their book, as they elaborate in the Naga word, language varied from village to village. And often across kales, that's wards, within the same village, there was no uniform grammar, script, epic, or song that would transcend village frontiers and connect multiple localities. I mean, this is radical decentralization, really radical decentralization. Now, this radical decentralization, right, is the condition of demos, democracy, right, of being demotic and thinking with the demos, being like the demos. And what they're really saying is this, although they don't argue this, and that's what I mean, that they don't, they don't always think about the implications of what they're saying, that you see in the modern world, one of the liberal canonical ideas is that dialogue and exchange 
is wonderful. We should have more of it. Well, in fact, maybe we should have less of it. Because in the present circumstances of enormous inequity and inequality, both inequity and inequality, the, it, under the circumstances where if you look at the political economy of knowledge production, it is completely dominated by the West. Right? Under these circumstances, cultural exchanges, intellectual exchanges, so to speak, encounters, dialogues, will mean that smaller cultures will be completely swallowed up. That has been happening for a very long period of time. The pace at which it's happening is going to accelerate. People have this mistaken notion that because we are committed in the modern world to diversity and all of that, that all of this is being arrested. In fact, to the contrary, we are losing languages, we are losing species. Right? We are losing different ways of thinking about the world, which vary considerably from the kind of intellectual legacies of the West captured, of course, largely, not entirely, but captured in the term the Enlightenment, right? And so forth and so on. Um, so this book uh, may have some limitations, but I think it is a, a very arresting work almost a radical work. It's a work that will be mocked by some, but I think it's a work that deserves our attention, and I love the spirit of this work. I don't say that often about many books, uh, but I do think that Subaltern Studies 2.0 is really endearing in its own way.